Well, if you would open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. We get to study the Bible today. Hallelujah! (laughs) Isn't that a delightful thing? We get to spend the next few moments meditating on God's Word. Meditating on the eternal word of God, the word that has power to change us, the word that gives life to the lifeless, the word inspired and preserved by the hand of God himself. As the writer of Hebrews says, when the scripture is studied, God is speaking. Let's read Ephesians Chapter 4, verses 17 through 24, we're going to be looking at the second half of this paragraph in Paul this morning, following up on the message a couple of weeks ago. The second half of this passage, it says this. Let's begin in verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The New York Times Magazine wrote an article that had the following headline. The educational experiences that change a life. In the article, there were brief summaries written by a number of notable figures who have accomplished something or another in different fields of influence. One was the author George Saunders, and he writes the following about his years in high school and a significant educational impact that changed his life. He says this, when I was a senior in high school, my career plan was, colon, there was this kid in our school who knew someone, who knew someone, who knew this guy, who knew someone in the Eagles. That's a band, in case you don't know. In the Eagles. This kid was putting together a sort of all-star band that would, through the special intervention of the guy who knew the guy who knew the guy, be opening next fall for the band that opened for the band that sometimes opened for the Eagles. (laughs) That, he says at the beginning, was my career plan. I was, in other words, on the path to nowhere, but would have only found this out a year or two later. Luckily, I was in the sphere of influence of two wonderful teachers. I was, in other words, on the path to nowhere, but would have found this out a year or two later. Luckily, I was in the sphere of influence of two wonderful teachers. This passage in Ephesians, uses the education of metaphor to talk about something that has transformed or changed or been transferred to a Christian. It's a, it's a definition passage. What does it mean to be a Christian? It's a life-defining passage using the metaphor of education or knowledge. You notice earlier in the passage with a few verses above, it talks a lot about ignorance and the darkening of the minds of the Gentile world. So it pictures these people as walking around in ignorance and darkness, uninformed, unaware, 
uneducated, you might say, of the most important things. And that results in an inevitable way of life. And they are not headed to nowhere. They are headed to wrath and destruction in light of their ignorance of the most important things. But then he sets a contrast. He sets a contrast from the path to devastation that they are on and a Christian, and he reminds the Ephesians Christians, you have been educated differently. You have come into the sphere of influence of a particularly important teacher. You have come into a a school of influence. Something transpired. Let me give an educational metaphor that redirected the course of your life, Paul says. Knowing Jesus Christ, Paul would say, has given us a new way of life. Knowing Jesus Christ has given us a new way of life. That's his point in this passage, using this educational metaphor. No, he says, that, in other words, their way of life, in ignorance of the glory of God and the gospel, walking that out in in sinful habits of lifestyle with callous and sensuality, greedy to practice every impurity. But, But that is not, he says, the way you learned Christ. Knowing Jesus Christ, Paul says to the Ephesians, has given you a new way of life, no longer a path to destruction. A new way of life transferred to you. The educational experience that literally changed your eternity. Two points this morning. Remember the school of Christ and remember your gospel lessons. Remember the school of Christ and remember your gospel lessons. Let's look down here at how this passage sort of breaks down grammatically. First, Paul makes these strong statements of contrast saying that that you were in the school of Christ. That's the first point. That is not the way you learned Christ, he says. Remembering you heard about him and were taught in him. And then then he goes out of that. He flows out of this main point. You went through an, an educational experience and then he reminds them of three lessons that they received in that education. So that's the two points this morning. Remember the school of Christ and then remember your gospel lessons as he breaks down what they learned in that school. So the first point, remember the school of Christ. That is not, he says in verse 20, the way you learned Christ, assuming assuming that you have heard him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Now, a very important point about these uh, piling up phrases, not the way you learned Christ, assuming you have heard him. Uh, In some ways, the English um, prepositions here undermine a point that Paul is making. You see it very clearly in that first phrase. That is not the way you learned Christ. The next phrase, actually, technically, literally, we would say, assuming that you have heard him. You have heard him. The way way Paul pictures this is not merely of a, a factual transfer. It's not an education that you just download information. This is a very personal education. You might think of something more like an internship where you're walking along with someone. This is not as much classroom setting as it is personal interaction. That was an education to meet that person, we might say. That's what Paul is saying. You received an education when you came face to face to Jesus Christ. Oh, he says, that is not the way you learned Christ. You learned not just the facts about him, though not less than that, but you learned him. You learned him, using this educational metaphor. You learned Jesus Christ. And he says, you heard him. It's as though he pictures in the preaching of Paul, Christ himself was speaking into the hearts of these Ephesians. They were receiving this this gospel transfer of Jesus Christ himself in the preaching of Paul. And you were taught in him. In other words, he is is teaching. He is the content of teaching. And he's the sphere of teaching. Look at those those three phrases. It's it's remarkable. Paul Paul basically says, Christ is all in all. 
He is the content of the teaching. He is the teacher. You've heard him. And he is the sphere of teaching. He's the schoolhouse. You were taught in him. You see that? You learned Christ. You heard of Christ. And you were taught in Christ. So Christ is simultaneously the content, the teacher, and the schoolroom. Everything about this education is Jesus, he's saying. He is the all in all. This education is no less than a personal transforming encounter with Jesus Christ. And he's reminding them of this. The Gentiles walk this way. There's an ignorance of the most important thing. But not so for you. You encountered Christ. You heard Christ. You were taught in Christ. Everything about you changed because you have had this school of Christ, defined by him, taught by him, sphered by him, the sphere of influence that is Christ, you came into that sphere and encountered him and received the truth about him. And that's precisely how Paul ends to make it very clear as the truth is in Jesus. To make it very clear, this is not mere factual knowledge. This is not just a transfer of religious ideas. This is a personal, life-transforming, educating, enlightening encounter with the divine Son of God. This is you. Remember the school of Christ, Paul says. Brian Chapel, the commentator, says this. The word for come to know here does not refer only to head knowledge, raw understanding, but also to relational knowledge. This is an unusual expression. Paul is speaking of the Ephesians' early encounter with the gospel as a relational encounter with Christ himself. This Jesus that we worship is not merely a historical figure. Listen to that. It is not. He is not merely a historical figure or a religious concept. He is real and living. And by his truth, his spirit testifies of his reality in our lives. Not as a history lesson, but as the truth of a living personality. We can have relationship with the one who created all things and loves us eternally. I think that's the point of his climactic phrase there. The truth is in Jesus. Very unusual in Ephesians for Paul to use Jesus rather than Christ, but he's trying to make a very specific point, so I think he hammers it home. The truth is in Jesus. This is not just a a, a Christ of theology. This is Jesus. Jesus the man. Jesus the God man. Jesus the person. This is your education. That's why I I love the scriptures because there there are passages of scriptures that speak uniquely to each generation. And this school of Christ point that Paul's making here, I think is desperately needed in our generation and this time, especially among Bible Belt, historic evangelical centers of the country. Because he... He says there's, there's an education that you received. and We need this for two reasons. First of all, many, many people who would call themselves Christian think of Christianity primarily in terms of moralism. Do some things and don't do other things. But they, they separate the do some things and don't do other things from the definitive life-changing moment that is the school of Christ. Now, now, certainly in this passage, as it continues, Paul's going to get to practices and habits. So start or keep doing these good things. Don't do these bad things. He'll use the phrase, put off bad behavior and put on good behavior. But in this passage, he's not primarily concerned with what we're called to do. He's cur- concerned with reminding us of this definitive identity-shaping change. He wants to take us back to school. He wants to take us back to that moment in the classroom where we first met that life-changing teacher. This is an inspirational moment for Paul. He'll get to exhortation, but this is an inspirational moment primarily, and then he'll move on to the application of that. But he's saying, look, remember, you remember that? Remember that. Imagine if that author that we read about earlier, that author, later in his life, he just said, you know what? I, I... I'm just going to get in my garage. I can't really play music much, but I just, I think I should just go kind of bang away on a guitar a little bit and see. I think that's, I mean, you know, 
I, th- I think I'm just going to do that in the garage. I, I don't really have any big plans. I, I, I think, I, you know, so I'm just going to stay home today and focus on macaroni and cheese and some movies and see what I can pluck out on guitar. I think that'd be the good thing to do. And then what happens? It, it, it comes to his mind that moment where he met that teacher. He encountered that sphere of influence and the inspiration, the the transforming moment of that encounter comes back to his mind. He says, wait a minute, I can't, I can't do that. My life's been changed. I I can't waste my life on on these other things. My life's been transformed. I I have a a new direction, a new path. I I can't go back to the path to nowhere. I have, a, I have a meaning, I have a purpose, I have an encounter, I, I remember that moment. I was in that school, and that's what every Christian should be able to say. Oh, I remember that moment, I was in that school. I was, I was there face to face with that, that moment where I encountered that person and it transformed me, it gave me a new direction in life, no longer on the path to nowhere, now on the path to somewhere. The encounter with Jesus, it did, it gave me a new way of life. Definitively, unchangingly, I have been to the school of Jesus Christ. Yes, I have. I have this experience regularly. I've heard other people do as well. I think it's mostly people like me, lazy in school that get this experience. But you, you have a dream that you didn't finish a class. Uh, it's so terrible. It is awful. And in, your, in the dream, like the whole semester is passing by and you keep forgetting. You know you're forgetting, but you just, oh, I'm on my way to class and wait, it's over already. And then at some point in the dream, it always happens, it fast forwards to the end. And somehow there's this crazy illusion the way dreams work that I'm still going to try to go to the final. And I haven't been to class all semester, but I'm really desperately worried in the dream about, will I be able to pass the final? As if you would have a chance. But you're thinking that anxiety is there in the dream. And then it ends the dream. You didn't. You didn't go to class all semester. And you always wake up. I I wake up. You wake up with this dreadful sense, I didn't graduate. (laughs) They they made a mistake. And I have this sense of paranoia. They're probably coming to look for me. They're going to say, I don't know what we did, but you didn't attend class the whole semester. You failed your final. Can we please have your degree back? Uh, You wasted student. I mean, they want to say this to me in my dream, and I have to say to myself, I graduated. (laughs) I wake up, and it takes a couple of seconds. I, I graduated. I, they couldn't have made that mistake. They wouldn't have. No, I walked. I mean, it was, it was not very grandiose. It was quick, but my name was mentioned. I walked across that. Yes, I did. I wasn't anything special, but I did walk across that thing, and I, they did. I did. I graduated. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. It takes me a minute. Well, Christians need that too. This isn't a school you graduate. It's a school you're plucked out of nothing, placed into, and transformed solely by the mercy of another. But the same fact needs to encounter us. I encountered Jesus, and he gave me a new way of life. Yes, he did. And this dream that I've been having, that somehow, well, no, I, I don't know where, where my life's going. I'm not really sure. I, don't, I have nowhere to go. I'm on the path to nowhere Wait a minute, no I'm not. That is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming, and that word assuming is some, somewhat unhelpful in the English. It might be better to say since, or since you have, since you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Yes, you did. You encountered Jesus Christ. You are no longer on the path to nowhere and destruction. You have a new way of life. Remember the school of Jesus Christ. Defining, life-changing, untakeable. Dads, you cannot be the same dad after you've encountered Jesus Christ. You have a new way of life. You have a new way of life. Moms, you cannot be the same mom after you've encountered Jesus Christ. You've been to the school of Christ. You have a new way of life. 
teens, you cannot be the same kind of teenager as the teenagers you see in the world who understandably are living for everything other than God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the darkness of their minds because they're alienated from the life of God and because they have a hardness of heart. But you, you have been to the school of Christ. If you're a Christian youth, you can't live like other youth. You've been given a new way of life. The defining change has taken place. Now, if, if you are one of those, those people, and, and I know people like this, and I love them, but I grieve for them sometimes. And I've, I've talked to folks in counseling. Like, man, it is so hard. I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm, I'm trying to serve God. It never goes anywhere. I remember talking to a young person one time. That was just their expression. They're just discouraged and depressed. And this wasn't just a season for them. Every Christian faces seasons like that. But it wasn't just a season. It seemed to come back over and over and over. I, I never get any. I try to obey and never get anywhere. I never make progress. And I, I felt it was important to ask this question. Have you encountered and given your life to Jesus Christ definitively? Because every Christian struggles. That's normal. That's why he's writing this, because he knows we struggle and we're tempted to go back to the way of life. That's a normal thing. But it's also possible to sort of be around the school of Christ, to have earshot towards it, to know a lot of facts and figures, and then to try to transition from that to do good and not do evil and feel like, man, this doesn't work. That would be similar to if you're an engineer and you live close to uh, an engineering school and you, you kind of earshot in class. What are they doing? And you occasionally hang around the students and then you go out and try to do an engineering job. Like, this is terrible. I have no idea what I'm doing. I try and I fail. But I've lived next to the engineering school my whole life. It's so frustrating. I mean, I've, I've kind of, you're shot of classes. I know a lot of facts. I've heard them say things, force, speed, mass. I, I mean, I, I've heard those terms. I know those terms really well. I know some multiplications. I even attended a class one time. I, I, I mean, I, I am there. I, I'm with you. And I come to work, and I try to do my engineering work, and it is a disaster. And it's so discouraging. I'm like, why am I even trying to do this? I don't know what the point of this is. And at some point, when that happens over and over, I feel compelled to say, have you, have you encountered Jesus Christ? There's a lot of Christians that struggle in this way too, and, and, and they're tempted and discouraged, and I want to comfort them. The Lord is at work, and maybe you need help to see how God is working in you. But I'm talking right now to people who, th they're trying to obey and live a godly life without encountering God in the first place. Never going to happen. Actually, I think it's some of the most pathetic and terrible and pitiful moments in the world. A person who's trying to be godly without knowing God? Trying to be Christ-like without knowing Christ? Trying to honor the Lord without knowing him as Lord? You can't do it. It's discouraging and depressing. Yes, it is. I understand. Let me encourage you to do this. If that's you, if you're a young person, or maybe you're an older person, and that's, that's where you feel like your life is. Go back to a moment, and, and maybe this is just a refreshing reminder for you, like Paul's saying to these Christians, and maybe it's for the first time. A Christian has said, you are my Lord. My life belongs to you. You have given me a new way of life. Everything I am is transformed because of who you are, what you have done. You died for my sins. You have canceled the record of debt against me. I now call you king rather than selfishness king. I am yours. That's what a Christian says. And they struggle to live it out, definitely. But if you try to live it out and you've never actually said that to the Lord, oh my goodness, impossible. Can't do it. Discouraging and depressing. Remember the school of Christ. Remember, if you're a Christian, remember this. You encountered Jesus Christ, the crucified Lord. 
who died for your sins and in his life gave you a new way of life. Remember the school of Christ. Point number two, remember your gospel lessons. Remember your gospel lessons. Paul breaks out of the main point that you encounter Jesus Christ and were educated in him, and he breaks into three lessons that we learned in that school. Here's the lessons. Lesson number one, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Lesson number one. So when we came to that school, the first thing we were taught and what we did decisively and definitively when we came to the gospel is we put off an old way of life. The, The metaphor here is of a garment being taken off and removed, an identifying garment that we take off and remove. Again, Paul is gonna talk about the ongoing practice of putting off certain certain sin tendencies, but this passage, and especially this phrase, is not focused on our ongoing putting off nearly as much as it is the definitive declaration of putting off that took place when we came to Jesus. That this is our identity. We put off the old man as our central identity. We put it off, it says. We put off, here's the lesson we received when we came to Christ in the gospel, this life-transforming lesson that changed our lives. One way it changed our life was by putting off the old self, that could be the old man, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Paul paints this life accurately and he hammers against the deceit of sin because even Christians look back at their old life and at times can feel a certain envy. Why? Because the very nature of that life is deceitful. It promises what it does not deliver. Adultery promises enthusiasm and fun. It delivers brokenness and hopelessness. Selfishness promises control and power. It delivers emptiness and alienation. Idolatry promises rest and relaxation. It delivers enslavement. Paul paints it the way it actually is. But here's the good news. You put that off when you came to Christ. You hung it on him on the tree and he died for that way of life. He crushed the power of that way of life. And though it may still wriggle and squirm and seek to exert influence, the fangs of its power have been taken away and you no longer are under its overwhelming influence. You put it off. That's the definition of what it means to have come to Christ. You'll still fight the dying gasps of it in your life. Sometimes that struggle will be hard, but it is no longer your identifying center. Lesson number one. Lesson number two, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And you can see Paul trying to be pastorally wise here. That first put off, the grammar of it accents this once decisive decision that's made in the gospel to transfer our allegiance to a new man to receive a new identity. There's a grammar, the way it defines it, it focuses on the past. This grammar focuses on the ongoing practice of this, to be renewed in mind, something we do all the time as a Christian. We're made new, but we're constantly renewed, Paul seems to be saying. We're renewed ongoingly. We're made new in the spirit of our mind. He's saying our our, our minds have to constantly be re-educated to the gospel. We're educated once and for all, but we never really leave the school of Christ. There's a definitive encounter with it in the first place, but we don't move on from it. We don't move on from the lessons of the gospel. We just keep renewing our mind over and over again in this truth. Yes, I have a new way of life in Christ. I have a new identity in Christ. I am no longer under condemnation. 
I am no longer under guilt. I am no longer under curse. I'm no longer chained to sin. I'm no longer chained to the hatred of God. I now can see God as glorious rather than hateful. I now see his authority as delightful rather than hateful. I have been given a new way of life and my mind is continually renewed. Remember, he says, this lesson that you are to be renewed. It's passive. That means God is doing these things through his word and through his spirit ongoingly in the life of the Christian. The gospel is being imprinted in greater and greater depth and passion into our soul. Ongoingly, we are renewed. Remember that lesson in the school of Christ? Lesson number three, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So we don't go to neutral when we put off the old way of life. We also put on in Christ a new way of life, and it is a defined way of life, a defined self. It is created after the likeness of God, so we are recreated in the image of God. We're made in the image of God, sin mars and distorts that image, and then our new spirit is recreated in the image of God. And if you want to know what that image is, it is true righteousness and holiness. Note the, note the contrast between truth and falsehood and deceit. Truth, the real world, as it were, where the real eternal world is imprinted, the likeness of God is imprinted on Christians. They put on the image of God in Jesus. Jesus Christ, that is their new identity. Now, now we're going to move on from this passage to passages that, that talk about how do we apply this in daily life? How do we live this out? How do we function in this? But for now, Paul's focus is on remember the gospel lessons. Remember the school of Christ. Remember, it's a personal thing, not just factual. Remember the life-transforming encounter you had with Jesus that changed everything. Remember it. That is not the way you learned Christ. Not that way. You learned a new way when you encountered him. What was that way? Well, you learned to put off your old way of life. You learned to be renewed ongoingly in the school of the gospel. And you learned to put on a new self. And this was definitive. Yes, it is applied ongoingly day to day. But there was a moment at which the old identity was no longer your identity. The new identity in Christ was given to you and it is renewed every day. Remember, you encountered Christ Jesus. Our encounter with Jesus has given us, has given us definitively, has given us. This is not something that you can choose to do or not do as a Christian, choose to be or not be. This is, this school is not a school that can be ignored. When you're put in this school, you're changed. You walk out and you are different. You have a different way of life. And you fulfill that in your practice, certainly, but you have been given it. Let me say this to you if you're a Christian. You have a new self given to you after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. That is the real you. That is the real you. I know sin struggles hard, but that's the real you. It flops and writhes and wriggles, but that is the real you. That is you. Sometimes Christians, in, a, in a, a valiant desire to fight against sin, focus on the remaining influence of sin. And we have to do that at some level. I mean, that's what Paul tells us to do, to feel conviction when we continue in a practice of sin. We don't want to act like it's not present and live in denial in that kind of sense, right? It is present in our life. But sometimes I think Christians focus on the remaining influence of sin and neglect the factual identity that has been given them, the calling, the purpose, the new life that is is theirs in Christ Jesus. It's good to remember that. You were made for righteousness and holiness. Let me say that again. You were made for righteousness and holiness. You were made for righteousness and 
and holiness. You were made for righteousness 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 and holiness. Definitively, unchangingly, untransferably, you were made for righteousness and holiness. We were made for the image of God and the glory of the gospel of Christ. We are not mere moralists trying to live a better life. We were made. When we were in Seguin for the youth retreat, I was talking to, we were talking to one of the pastors down there, and, and frankly, those men in Seguin are just more manly uh, than anybody on this stage, and uh, probably anybody in this church, maybe a couple exceptions. Those guys live a manly life, a little outside of my, my normal categories, and you can tell that by where their men's meetings are. <laughs> Our men's meetings are in air-conditioned places with coffee and barbecue. Uh, their men's meetings are out in the wilderness, so one of the things that they told us was at one of these meetings, they encountered this gigantic gigantic rattler snake, all right? This thing was, I mean, the pictures of it were apocalyptic. I, in my, I think of rattlers as like small, and this thing was like fat. I'm like, this is like a python rattler, all right? Not fair, not fair, rattler world, not fair. A huge, I mean, a huge snake. I mean, you talk to some, like, talk to Bart and Mark, they're like, it wasn't that big. I thought it was huge, okay? And they in, again, the manliness that's present in that church, some guy sledgehammered it to death. <laughs> Which is, again, outside of my normal manly categories here. He <laughs> uh, incredible. He sledgehammered it. They cut the head off, okay? Of this, I mean, good for them. Chop the head off this thing. But obviously, this is a trophy. So I guess they were going to fry it up and eat some of this thing and, and skin it and everything. Again, <laughs> this is a different category. Enjoy your Starbucks, Round Rock people, okay? Uh, this is, <laughs> so, so here they were, and they had it apparently in a bucket in the back seat of a Jeep that had no doors. And my friend and his son were in the back seat. They had it in a bucket. And I didn't know this to this level, but apparently when you cut the heads off a snake, it still moves a lot. I know, it's gross, right? It still moves a lot, and this is a ginormous snake. So at one point, a friend is, is driving, pastor and his son are in the back seat, they got the snake in a bucket. The, the snake body, headless snake body, comes up out of the bucket and strikes the driver in the neck. I mean, I'm pretty sure I would have died. He, he, he hits him, it, the headless, okay, no head on this thing, out of the bucket, bam, back of the neck, he screams, and I don't know when this exactly happened, but my friend said at one point, when that snake jumped, he said, we, it's a good thing that thing had no doors on the sides, like a rain sheep, we were out, okay? <laughs> it jumped, and we were out the side doors of this thing, and, it, and he's like, grab a hold of that thing! No kidding, that's what I would have said too. Do not let it go. I know it can't hurt me, kill me, but don't let it go. In Christ, the dominion of our old man has been removed. It's been removed. It still moves. It still influences. It still scares. We might even allow it to dominate us for some period of time if we forget the school of Christ and what happened there. Because it's still attached to us. We've shed it definitively, but it it's still there, the old flesh, the new man that is inside of us. It's defining us. It's shaping us. But sometimes that thing wriggles. It moves us in certain ways. Now the head is gone. It can kill us no longer. But it can still be messy sometimes. Frightening even. Influential. And if we forget who we are, 
That we are no longer in the image of the old man influenced by that dragon-hearted tendency to hate God. If we forget that, we might move with it. But Paul says, no, remember the school of Christ. Remember the defining moment of the gospel. You encountered a dying savior who died for your sins. He crushed the curse of your sin. He chopped off the power, the dominion of sin in your life. Yeah, it's still present and influencing ways. It wriggles, it moves, it scares you sometimes. It moves you in the wrong direction. But remember, you know Jesus Christ, the serpent crusher, the teacher of the gospel, the Savior, and knowing him gives you a new way of life. What is that new way of life? Well, it's putting off the old man. That's what you did when you came to Christ, being renewed in your mind and putting on the new man. You have a new way of life. You have a new way of life. Don't wriggle with the snake that is your flesh. It's been put off in the gospel. What's been put on is a calling of righteousness and godliness. The renewing of our mind in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe you would define yourself, some people would, as a, a declining Christian recently. I feel I've slid back to ways I used to move in the flesh. What a great passage. Go back to the moment you encountered Jesus Christ. Remember what that encounter says about you and did for you. Remember. Remember, go back to the cross where you met Jesus Christ and you saw the guilt of your flesh nailed to him on that tree and you felt the freedom and forgiveness that comes by believing in Jesus as your substitute. That's the school of Christ. That happens as we kneel before that cross and we gaze into his atoning eyes and we believe in him. And through his blood, the head of our guilt and shame and the power of sin is broken. And we are allowed to receive from him a new identity, life in him godliness and holiness set free from the deceit of sin. If you're a declining Christian, go back to that same cross and enjoy that again. Imagine if you could go back years later to the teacher that changed your life and every time you discouraged, you could talk to them again. But we can. Anytime. We go back to that same cross. We commune with that same Savior. We hear him resurrected speak through the Spirit and remind us and assure us that the, the school of the gospel is not a fraud. It's truth. We've encountered him. We have a new way of life. We're not going nowhere. Maybe you're a plateau Christian. Reached a comfortable ledge avoiding criminal activities, relatively stable family, but if someone were to ask you, how are you growing in Christ, you wouldn't have a ready answer. I'm, I'm sort of maintaining in Christ right now. Maintaining in Christ is not a biblical category. It means we gotta reach for that next ledge. It's gonna make you feel vulnerable again. But good news, you went to the school of Christ. You have a new way of life. You're called up in him. Maybe you're here and you're not a Christian and you've been trying hard to be a decent person. This book is an invitation to attend a school with a teacher that wants to meet with you, that wants to encounter you, that wants to change you, that wants to forgive you, that wants to give you a new way of life. Free of charge, tuition paid. Just respond to him. Ask for forgiveness for your sins and receive the lessons that he gives.
No one here need be on a path to nowhere. Everyone here either has or can encounter Jesus Christ and knowing him be given a new life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would privilege our church with a sense of the honor of godliness and righteousness. Wherever, Lord, we have been living, main, maintaining in Christ kind of lives, I pray you would give us the joy and privilege of growing in you, fulfilling the education we received at the foot of that cross. We encountered you for the first time. I pray, Lord, that we would have a hunger and thirst for righteousness, that we may be filled, Lord, that your definitive defeat of the power of sin and guilt would shape and change us. Lord, I pray for every Christian that they would walk out proudly wearing the badge made new in Christ. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.